Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Fairdale this morning. We're glad that you're with us. We're excited to worship this morning. And as you are finding your seat and getting situated, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 7 for our call to worship this morning. Psalm 7 is going to be our, our call to worship. Uh, as you can tell, I'm eagerly uh, awaiting for spring training to begin. So let's go Mets. Uh, but as, as you're turning in your Bible to Psalm 7, a couple announcements for you. We have restarted our Tuesday morning visitation. And obviously during COVID, this is looking a little bit different. Uh, it's more so calling and writing letters. And so this is open for anybody. Uh, if you're available at Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock, we would love for you to be a part of this. Uh, there's plenty of people in our church that could use a phone call or a handwritten letter. They would, they would love that. Also, we've got our dates figured out for the 24 hours of prayer. This is going to be February the 19th and the 20th. All right, so it'll start on Friday evening at 5 p.m. It'll go until Saturday at 5 p.m. And we will have a sign-up sheet downstairs outside the office for you to sign up for an hour to pray. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to get together with other people that maybe you don't normally get to hang out with and, and get together, pray together, encourage one another, and, and pray for our church, our community, and, and all of that. Also, for the four Sunday evenings in the month of February, we are doing a new series looking at translations of the Bible. Uh, Pastor Josh Womble is going to lead this, and you know, he's going to teach through how do we get all these different translations that we have, which is the best, uh, all of those questions related to that. So that is going to be the four Sunday evenings in February. All right, there's plenty of other announcements. Make sure you're looking at your bulletins, but let's look at Psalm 7 for our call to worship this morning. O oh Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O oh Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is any wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift up yourself against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assemblies of the people be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God, my shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword, and his bent and readied, he has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold... The wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. God, we thank you this morning. That as we are gathered together, you are a God who provides refuge. And Lord, all of us at many moments in life are in need of refuge. Life around us seems crazy. It seems overwhelming. It seems like we cannot handle it. But Lord, we are reminded that we can run to you. And that when we do, you will be our refuge. God, we thank you that you love us despite all of our wrongdoings. And God, we pray that we would examine our own hearts, even this morning, as we are here to worship you. God, we pray that we could say with the psalmist, or ask with the psalmist, that you would judge us according to our righteousness and according to the integrity that is in us. Lord, may we be people who are seeking after Jesus who are living a righteous life, who are, are people full of integrity. And God, may we be reminded that we get righteousness and we get integrity from you, from your son. God, may we keep our eyes focused on Jesus this morning. As we worship, may all of the songs that we sing and the, the preaching that is done be in uh, 
praise to Jesus for what he has accomplished on our behalf. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us? standing and greet one another. you return to your seats as we continue in song. Now 
magnificent, marvelous, matchless land, too vast and astounding to tell. A forever existing in worlds apart, now offered and given to all. No fountain of beauty eternal, the Father, the Spirit, the Son. Sufficient and endlessly generous, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exalted they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness. All life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with color. You paint every shade in the sky. Each day the dawn wakes as an encore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure His love is. And marvelous, matchless love. What grace that you entered our brokenness. You came in the fullness of time. How far we have fallen from righteousness, but not from the mercies of Christ. Your cross is our door to redemption. Your death is our fullness of life. That day of forgiveness flowed as a flood. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure His love can us forever. And marvelous, matchless love. United in your resurrection, you lift us to infinite heights. Could anything seven would take us from magnificent, marvelous, matchless love? How great, how sure his love. How great, how sure His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount our poor, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace. Dark is the state that we 
Scripture reading this morning will be from 1 John chapter 2, and we'll be reading verses 15 through 19. 1 John 2, 15 through 19. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We, we love you, we praise you, we adore you. Lord, we pray that you would, would be with us be near to us, Lord. Lord, and as we read in your, your word, the, the admonitions for us to be ready and to be prepared, we pray that we take that to heart, Lord. We pray that we live each and every day of our lives in preparation for the return of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would live with an urgency to make you known, to make the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, known to the world, we pray, Lord, that many would be saved through our witness and our testimony to how great and how awesome you are and how loving and how merciful your son is. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us today as we worship. We pray that, that you would pierce our hearts, Lord, that you would help us not to walk away from here just feeling that we've heard a good message, Lord, but we pray that you would help us to walk away from here changed. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing? was 
pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship your name, God. And as we take up the offering, Lord, we ask that it would be used to spread your message in our community and in our nation and throughout the world, God, and that you would give us opportunities this week to witness and share the gospel with other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. don't know God and no one they know knows God Thai people have a desperate desire to get rid of the sin that they know they have they're they're going to the temples and they're 
taking money and gold and flowers and anything they can do that they think is good that might erase the sin that they know that is inside them. My calling to be a doctor and calling to be a missionary came on the same day. When the missionary came and spoke at our church, he said the line, the saddest thing I've seen after 35 years on the mission field is children sick and dying because there's no doctor to care for them. And it was a like a lightning bolt through my soul. And I said, okay, God, I'll be a medical missionary. Our ministry here takes mobile clinics all over the country of Thailand. Church planners call me up and say, I'm trying to start a new church where there's never been one, will you come and help me? Medicine is just a means for me to share the gospel with those who have no other access. When I talk about how to take care of their physical needs, it's just so easy for them to see when I start talking about their soul that they need a savior as well. And American churches have partnered with me in that. And they have sent me short-term mission teams that come with me for about a week every month. And we go out and do mobile clinics all over the country. Without the churches coming alongside me, I cannot do what I do. In general, people here do not like talking about spiritual things. But on mobile clinic, we can talk to 100 people in a day, 200 people, 300 people in a day that will come to mobile clinic and there we can share Christ with so many people at one time. It makes mobile clinic a great avenue for sharing the gospel. The point of mobile clinics is to start churches, groups of Thai believers that will go on to grow people in their new faith, to disciple them in their understanding of who Christ is, and to grow them together into groups that will become churches. There's a lot of things that money can't buy. Being able to be here and see God praised where he has never been praised before. That is a dear joy. Seeing souls saved in areas where no one has ever known God before. Watching them grow in their faith and lead others to faith. And watching them grow together into churches. Seeing churches start where no one has ever worshiped God before. Money can't buy that. So this morning is Sanctity of Life, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, and back on January 22nd in 1984, President Ronald Reagan issued a presidential proclamation making the third Sunday of January a national day to recognize sanctity of human life. And today and every day since then, pastors of local churches, leaders in local churches have been making sure to draw attention and awareness to the importance of recognizing the sanctity of human life from the moment of conception. It's a heavy topic. It's a very important topic. It's one that we hope and pray that all of us find, find very important important not only in, in the lives of those children that would potentially be aborted, but in the lives of the family, the life of our church, the life of our nation. So today, as we, as we think about the importance of human life, the importance of protecting those unborn lives, allowing them to be brought forth into the world, recognizing the blessing that they are, a blessing from God, we want to spend a little time this morning in prayer. But before we do that, I, I want to, to draw your attention to something just to, just to kind of help you understand the magnitude of the impact of this. We all have seen, and I know that we've seen at nauseam, the COVID numbers that are put forth and are available everywhere. You can, anytime you go on a website, they used to have scrollers across the bottom that would tell you the current infection rate, it would tell you how many people were currently recovered, how many people had passed away. And I think it's important for us as we, we kind of put things in perspective as how much attention that we have put on COVID is that it pales in comparison 
when we compare it to the number of abortions that are that are that are practiced upon or, or put upon these these innocent unborn children. And while the numbers have been decreasing since 1990, 1990 was sort of a high water mark, unfortunately. And there were over 1.4 million abortions that year. And if we compare that with our COVID deaths, we are at 395,000. Roughly 1 million more people died because they were aborted from the womb in 1990. Where was our scroll? Where was our banner? Where was our website telling us about how many children were being aborted? We didn't have it because our world did not care. But our God does. And as Christian people, we should care. And we should, we should rejoice to hear that the trend has been going down since then, certainly. But the most recent numbers that I could find from 2017 still show that there were 862,000 plus abortions performed in 2017. That's 2,300 some abortions a day, more than 98 per hour, one every 96 seconds. And our world remains silent on those deaths because it's not an unwanted mass it is not a health problem that needs to be resolved. Life. It is human life. And if it doesn't stir your heart, if it doesn't drive you to say, something must be done, then you may still have a heart of stone and not a heart of flesh that beats for our Lord. Christians, we must do something. We cannot remain silent. As much as we all talk about wearing face protection and washing our hands and doing everything that we can to save every life, where is the outcry for the unborn? You can be involved by praying. You can be involved by ministering to a young woman who may be pregnant and may be considering the abortion. You can be involved by supporting those agencies that provide alternatives for mothers. You can be involved by supporting the children's ministry in your neighborhood, in your local church. You can be involved by supporting the birth mothers and the families that are willing to adopt those children. There's lots of ways to be involved. Where is God directing you? Where is God stirring your heart? Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day, Lord. And we thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, we pray now specifically for the unborn. Lord, we know that every life that you give, every, every child that you, you place in a womb is special. Lord, and we pray that, that we would be broken over the fact that so many unborn children would be being aborted. Lord, it is, is a travesty, it is, it is sinfulness, and it is terrible that it goes on in relative silence. We pray, Lord, that you would stir our hearts. Help us to not be people that would, would sit by and just ignore things because they don't directly affect us, Lord, because we know that they do directly affect us. They, they directly affect an unborn child, it affects the mother, the father, our neighbors, our church. Lord, we pray that you would stir us to action. Help us not to be silent in matters of life and death like this. Help us, Lord, to, to seek to find ways to be involved. We pray that you, you would use your Holy Spirit to guide us, Lord, to know what we might be able to do. We pray, Lord, that you would help the mothers that are in these situations that are, might be considering aborting a child, Lord, that you would that you would help them to understand that it is a special thing that they have been given. Even if the circumstances were terrible in the way that the pregnancy came about, Lord, that life is special. 
And we pray, Lord, that you would bring good Christian people into that person's life. That they would see the wisdom, Lord, and not only having that child be born, but trying to provide the best life possible for them, whether that means that they raise them them themselves, whether they put them up for adoption and bless a family who so desperately wants a child. We pray, Lord, that you would help us each to continue to remember this, to continue to pray for this situation, to bring this to you, Lord. Help us to be involved as we're able. Lord God, we pray that you would bring this to an end. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We love you and we praise you. And we pray that you would protect our children. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Very well said. If you would, turn the Bible to James chapter 5. been a long journey, but we are to the end of the book of James. We're going to finish it up today with verses 19 and 20. It's been good for us. I think, I think you as a church have thought and felt, man, this is really good, and we've had a lot of feedback and response, and we've seen God working, and in big ways, like people professing Christ and a lot of people being baptized and joining the church. In small ways, like last Sunday sermon being about prayer. And this week, at all of our prayer meetings, there were more people than normal. We take that to be somewhat of a result from the preaching of the word in James. James has been good for us. But the one thing that everybody needs to know about James is that he is intense about believers being believers, about those who claim God to live for God. James is intense that hypocrisy is a shame and tragic and you ought not to be a fake. James seems to have no time for somebody who wants to be a nominal Christian, speaking that they love God, but living like they do not. James is frustrated by that. James knows the seriousness of sin. James knows the ugliness of the world killing, crucifying Jesus, James's brother. And so James came strong in these five chapters, in these 108 chapters verses. Since it's our last Sunday in James, I want to just look back and show you a couple of the high points. Look with me at James chapter 1, verse 7. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If you move on to James chapter 1, verse 22, you'll hear James say, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If you look at James chapter 1, verse 26, he says, if anyone thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Re worthless religion. If you go over to chapter two and you look at verse 14, James says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and be filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Look over to chapter three, verse 10, speaking about the tongue and our mouths and our speech. He says, from the same mouth, Come blessing and cursing, my brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. Turn over to chapter four. 
Verse four, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse seven, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is just a few places in James where you see his heart and conviction and burden. James is passionate that the church be the church. James is passionate that those who claim Jesus would live for him, and we see this very thing as his book ends. Many would say that James has an abrupt ending. It seems an odd way to end it. If this is a letter, then where's the uh, final words? If this is a sermon and written in a letter form, then maybe that makes a little bit more sense. It seems to just be cut off there. But if you know the fire that was inside of James by the Holy Spirit to make him committed to the truth and urge others to be committed to the truth, then perhaps this is a great way to end it with such emphasis. Let's not lighten it or weaken it or lessen it. Let's not try to fluff it up so that it ends on a positive note. Let's bring it all the way to the very end and leave the church left going, wow. Read with me, if you will, at James chapter five, verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James ends with big words. James ends with heavy doctrine. James ends with things that we, if we're gonna be in church, if we're gonna open this book, must address. Sin, and not just sin, but people that sin are sinners, James says. That's how he ends it. James goes to death. And man, we all try to avoid the conversation of death. Let's not talk about it, James does. It's the very end, it's the last verse of James's book, death. Wandering, straying, falling away. He mentions it twice. All around the subject of truth, not falling out of relationships, not falling out of the family, not falling out of good graces, not falling out of your job or your successes or your you know, hobbies, but falling away from truth. James is hitting the nail on the head, except there's like five or six nails right there, and he's hitting all of them right on the head with a collective emphasis, emphatic power to us, and it is really, really good. Commentator Douglas Moo says, for James, correct doctrine cannot be separated from correct behavior. What the mind thinks, what the mouth confesses, the body must do. Anything less than this is worldly, sinful, double-mindedness, according to James. Let me say that again. According to James, correct doctrine cannot be separated from correct behavior. What your mind thinks, what your mouth confesses, the body must do. Anything less is worldly, sinful, double-mindedness. And so James ends like this. He ends with a subject that we need to spend more time on. He ends with a subject that we need to address. He ends with a subject that, to be totally honest, is so encouraging and uplifting. One person trying to help another person stay close to God. One church member trying to help another church member stay close to God and the church. One person on the, 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 the narrow path helping others stick to the narrow path. This is a great subject and one that we need to study. He's talking about bringing back wanderers. And wander is a good word. It's, we, we know what it is. Y'all know what it means to wander. It's when you go to look something up on YouTube and 30 minutes to an hour later, you're looking at the most random, crazy videos you've ever seen in your life because they're so captivating, right? I like to look up on YouTube like animal fights, like an alligator versus a tiger, 
see which one wins, and I get into those and watch those. And 30 minutes later, I'm in this fascinating documentary about a man who got his face eaten off by a bear. I just wandered into who knows what. And I'm so glad when Val finally speaks up and says, stop watching that stuff. What are you doing? Turn it off. And she brings me back, right? Well, I mean, a little bit of wasted time over some engaging videos is not that bad. At least keep telling me it's not. But sin and death and God and truth are. And wandering away is tragic. It's tragic. It really is. James does us a big favor by bringing it up in closing. I want us to see three heavy points today. Number one, the danger of wandering away from truth. Number two, the duty to bring them back. And number three, the delight in being a part of it. The joy, the goodness, the encouragement of being a part of it. Number one, the danger of wandering away from truth. James begins it with this all too common address of my brothers. He uses this all the time, this is his go-to. Now, in the original, you know that brothers can mean brothers and sisters, and he's referring to the church. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. Now, this is loaded, and what's good about these two verses is that there is a lot in here. So let's see. He's speaking to believers. He's speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ. He's speaking to the church, if you will. That's who he's addressing. He's not preaching to the lost world. He's not preaching to people that don't believe. He's not preaching to people who've not read the Bible or have not been to a church service before. He's speaking to them. He says, my brothers. And then he makes it where even, even more closer to home because look what he says. If anyone among you... This isn't your family member that still denies the faith. This isn't somebody that you work with all the time that you really hope they come to know Christ. This isn't somebody on your ball team or or on your street that you've been trying to invite to church. That's not this. This is brothers and sisters in Christ, the people that are among us. Now you see how heavy it is. These are people that we used to see singing here on stage, and now they don't. These are people that used to run our personnel committee. These are people that used to work in the nursery and in the children's ministry. These are people that used to read their Bibles and would be the first one to sign up for Bible study. They used to be among us. They used to pray that people would be saved. They used to work toward that end. They used to believe in terms like sin and death and truth and brothers. They used to like that subject. They used to be willing to wake up early on Sundays to come and hear a talk like this. They were among us. They used to sit right there in those pews and hear these messages. They were among us. We need to have a category in our lives for those that used to be among us who have now wandered away. You know what? So many church people are scared to admit that that's a real category. So many church people are scared to acknowledge that that's a real category. James, knowing how real salvation is and knowing how worthy Jesus Christ is as Savior and Lord, worthy is the Lamb who is slain, James knows that this ought to be addressed. This cannot be the elephant in the room in your home or in our church. This cannot be the, the uncomfortable subject in our, uh, in our groups. This cannot be the uncomfortable topic at our members' meetings. Where is such and such? Where is he or she? What are they up to now? James says, if anyone among you wanders, y'all, there are people that wander. 
There are people that fall out and fall away and get away. There are. And the Bible doesn't say forget about it, ignore them, just keep on moving. The Bible says we want to see them come back. But before your mind is already thinking of all kinds of people who are wanderers right now, you must not miss the most specific part of this passage, that they have wandered from the truth. Does everybody see that? Point number one here today is the danger of wandering away from truth. That's important. It is not so tragic if they wandered away from your favorite hobby. If y'all used to play golf together all the time and now they're not into it, uh, that may not be as happy and enjoyable for you, but it's not tragic. God may not even be concerned about that. If y'all used to work together and y'all were together for so long and they decided they needed to change careers and so they resigned from working with you or for you, they wandered away from that, but that doesn't mean anything. If y'all live together for the longest time and they decide they need to move out and they're ready to just make some changes and grow up a little bit and try to form some responsibility, that is a type of wandering, but that's not this. Hey, if they used to go to church with you, but you know their heart was never in the right place, they never had the joy of the Lord or conviction of sin or burden for the lost or love for truth or devotion to truth, they may not have wandered away from the truth. They just wandered away from religion. But James already said in chapter one, it was worthless. Hey, you wander away from religion, you ain't really gone too far. You went from one lost place to another lost place. But what's a big problem? And what is a heartfelt concern of ours is people that wander away from truth. And there's a category for that. There are people, I kid you not, that every time you saw them, they were like this. There are people, I kid you not, that every time they were sitting right there, they were like this. There's a category for people that used to have this thing memorized. There are people who used to teach this word and preach this word. There are people in our church that were led to faith by people in our church who the people that were led to faith are still in the church. The people that led them to faith aren't even here anymore. There are soul winners that have wandered away from the truth. That's what James is talking about. Now, this word wandering is really, really common in the Bible, and I want to draw your attention to it. I mean, we really know what it means to wander, but I want to just show you a few things, and you don't have to turn there because today I'm going to show you a lot of Scripture because this is a heavy subject, and I'm going to try my best to not talk in ways that are distracting here today, but... Do you remember in the Gospels when the Sadducees tried to trick Jesus? They did it a few times, but you remember that? The Sadducees came to him. This is Matthew chapter 22. Sadducees came to him. They say there is no resurrection. They asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. So to the second, the third, and down to the seventh. And, and, and after them all, the woman died. And here's their question. Verse 28. In the resurrection, Jesus... Out of the seven, which one will be the wife? That's the question they asked him. Here's what Jesus answered. You're wrong because you neither understand the scriptures nor the power of God. The very word right there, you don't understand, is the same word here in James. You've wandered away. Wandering away means you, you don't understand. You've, you've went to apostasy. You've, you've, you've lost focus on understanding. You've gone from getting it to not getting it. You don't get truth anymore. And that's the very word there in Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29. In Titus, it's used again, and perhaps this one's gonna be a little bit more familiar to you. Titus does an awesome job of speaking of conversion. And in Titus chapter three, verse one, he says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Verse three, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray. There's the word. We used to be led astray. We used to be wanderers from the truth. 
Maybe we, didn't have, we never had the truth, but we were wandering, not understanding, led astray from truth. And that's what he says. He goes on to describe that position in verse three of Titus three, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another, wandering, led astray, not understanding. James says there's a category of people like that and it is absolutely dangerous. Not dangerous because they've changed, although that may be the guilt the world is putting on you. Not dangerous because you've you know, tried to make some improvements or not dangerous because you've made your life worse or because you're thriving or because you're not thriving. Right? Not dangerous from all these worldly categories, but dangerous because you have gotten away from the truth. And the truth is the truth of God, what God communicates to us so that we could know him. You remember that, that, that they asked the big question in the gospels, what is truth? And you remember that when Jesus was preparing heaven for us, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father apart, uh, except through me. Jesus is the truth. Jesus' word is the truth. You remember when Jesus prayed, God, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. You know what truth is. It is the way God communicates to us so that people who are blind from truth can see truth. It is the way God communicates to us so that people who are deaf to truth can hear truth. It is the way God communicates truth to us so that people who have stone hearts, which Matt McBroom referred to, dead stone hearts can have hearts that come alive and be sensitive to truth. Truth is knowing that God loves you. Truth is knowing that God's in charge. Truth is knowing that God has done everything to make you right with him through his son Jesus. Truth is knowing that you can't do anything to make yourself right with him. Truth is knowing that you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Truth is knowing that there's nothing good in you. Stop trying to convince yourself how good you are and go ahead and admit that you're not good enough in the eyes of God, but Jesus is. And when you trust in Christ, the truth says God loves you and he will never ever, ever forsake you. He will never, ever, ever stop forgiving you. The truth is, is you sin as much as you want to, and James 4, 6 says, but he has more grace. And we just sang grace greater than all our sin. We could spend the rest of today and the rest of our lives saying what truth is. The truth is the good news of God speaking to us through his word about how much he loves us and how much he forgives us. And there is a category of people who had seemed to know that truth who then wander away from it. And this is tragic. This is dangerous. In John chapter six, turn there real quick because you may have never seen this before and I want you to see it. In John chapter six, Jesus is just giving his first lesson on the I am's. There are seven I am's in John. In John chapter six is I am the bread of life. And Jesus says that. And whoever comes to Jesus will never hunger or thirst. They will be satisfied on the inside. They will have sustenance for life through and through like bread will do for you. That's what he says. Well, because he says that, these religious leaders are all worked up over, they don't understand that. Are they, is he really talking about drinking his blood? And is he really talking about eating his flesh? And they get into this whole weird conversation, all right? But look at 66, John 666, if you will. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Do you see that? They wander away. They turn back. They leave. They go away. John 6, 66 says many of Jesus' disciples turned back and stopped following him. They no longer walk with him. Well, look what happens. So Jesus said to the 12, next verse, 67. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And look at his answer in verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I want you to think about this in the context of James 5 now, wandering away from the truth. If somebody wanders away from the truth, where have they wandered to? Well, there's a thousand different options out there but not a one of them being true. If you wander away from truth, you've not had an epiphany. You've not had a better experience. 
You've not found another way, a better option. You've wandered away from truth. And in John 6, 66, many turned back. Jesus says, y'all wanna go too. And Peter says, where would we go? Wandering away from the truth is tragic. But it is a real category. And in that passage that we read in the middle of the service a little bit ago from 1 John chapter two, you heard John speaking about that. He says, there are many in the spirit of the Antichrist who go out from us. And he says the reason why they went out from us is because they were not among us. Now John in 1 John is not speaking necessarily of 1 Baptist Faraday, but he is speaking to the fact that there are people that were in the midst that now aren't. And that starts to speak to what do they love and what do they follow and what do we do with that? And that's what James is bringing up. There's a character in the New Testament called Demas. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's only mentioned three times in the entire Bible. But when Paul writes his letter to Philemon, okay, when Paul writes his letter to Philemon and he gets to the very end and he's saying his goodbyes, he says this at the end of Philemon. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner of Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, and so do Aristarchus, and so do Demas, and so do Luke, my fellow workers. And Demas is called in Philemon a fellow worker. What a compliment. The apostle Paul, that great missionary to the Gentiles, right? The one that we admire so much. He wrote the book of Romans, speaks of Demas, his brother in Christ as a fellow worker. What an encouragement. But later, Paul, uh, Paul would write to Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And at the end of 2 Timothy, he writes this. Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone on. James wants us to know there's a real category for those that wander away from truth. Josh Green and our pastors, we're not the truth. We're not the standard of truth. Jesus is. First Baptist Church of Fairdale is not the truth. We're not the standard of truth. Jesus is. And anything good about us would just be our commitment to the truth. Walking away from me doesn't mean you've done something wrong. Walking away from us doesn't mean somebody's done something wrong. Walking away from the truth, though, is tragic. It is a dangerous, dangerous thing. I know you've probably gotten dependent on your GPS just like I have. And I saw the progressive commercial. Y'all seen those where he's making fun of you being like your parents? Those are funny commercials. I don't have progressive, but they're funny. And there's that one commercial where the first thing he says what is, if you had to print out the directions to get here today, <laughs> you're like your parents. Our GPS can lead us astray sometimes, can't it? You know what happens when you get the wrong directions? You don't usually recognize it until you're at your destination, isn't that right? You ever been following the GPS and you're out in the middle of the road and you look at both sides and it's nothing but cornfields and it says, you have arrived. And you're like, this ain't, this ain't where I was going. I don't see any soccer fields out here. What's going on? Well, thankfully in that situation, you're able to recalibrate and try again. If you make it to your wandering from truth destination to find out that ain't where you thought you were going, you will not be allowed to turn back. You will not be allowed to try again. It will be too late. And so James says to every one of us, we ought to be about the work of helping people turn back while they can still turn back. So my second point is the duty of bringing them back. Look what he says in James. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, hallelujah. Amazing, what a subject. I mean, he just gets right to it like this. This happens. This happens, this can happen, this is a possibility. This is an option. And every one of us right now, I know, every one of us, and certainly me, are a little bit cloudy and discouraged today 
because we know of somebody who's wandered away from truth, right? Every one of us are walking with a little bit of a limp today because we know of somebody that's wandered away from truth. And instead of us being a pouty about it, we need to read James chapter five. That's why it's so good to read your Bible. And we need to hear that just as quickly as James introduces those people, James says, you can bring them back. Hallelujah. Praise God for the Bible and praise God for churches that read the Bible and praise God that we didn't just uh, give 10 sermons on the book of James and forget the last verse. No, this is a real category. You can bring them back. And so what we need to understand is here is a duty inside of New Testament Christianity of doing that work. Not ending relationships, not giving up, not ignoring them, not letting people fall through cracks or be out of sight, out of mind, but rather keep working, keep reaching out, keep calling, engaging, trying. He says, if anybody wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, which means he's not just saying that you could try, he's saying you could try and it happens. He's saying this is what churches do and this is what Christians do and it works. This is really cool. The duty to bring them back. You ever think about that? Have you ever done it? Are you trying to do it now? Do you have a friend that you used to talk with about the Lord and now you don't? Do you have a friend that used to be a prayer partner for you? You helped her and she helped you or you helped him and he helped you and y'all had each other's back and every once in a while you'd call each other just to say, hey, keep pressing on, man. God's with you. And that's gone now? And you really miss that in your life because that was such a sweet, godly relationship you had and it's just fallen away? Has the world gotten the best of them? Are they, are they overwhelmed? Are they distracted right now? And so that seems to have been lost. I mean, it, it used to be a really good godly friendship, but now it's not there. Well, God tells us here in James that they can be brought back. Stop being so discouraged over it. It is discouraging. But don't be so discouraged over that it's a lost cause. It's not a lost cause yet. James says we can bring them back. Commentator Moo goes on to say, not only should the readers of James do the words that he has written, they should be deeply concerned to see that others do them also. You should not just be thinking, man, I don't want my religion to be worthless, like he says in James 1, but I don't want their religion to be worthless either. I don't want to just lean into being a good church member. I want everybody who claims the church to be a good church member. This week, I had somebody in our community that I had never met with before, never, contact me and say, can we talk? It was awesome. We sat down and we talked. It was great. It was really good and profitable, healthy conversation. One of the things they said was, such and such told me I should reach out to you. Well, that such and such is a part of our church, but we hadn't talked in a long time. And I thought to myself, well, I'm glad he recommended us talk, but I sure he'd recommend to himself that we talk. See, when we believe that there is the Lord's power in engagement and reaching out and conversations and accountability around the truth, God works in it. It can be brought back. And we should be concerned about that. Moo goes on to say, it is by sharing with James the conviction that there is indeed an eternal death to which the way of sin leads that we shall be motivated to deal with sin in our lives and in the lives of others. We want to see people brought back. We want to see people who've been missing restored. We want to see people who are far from God in his truth, come back closer to God in his truth. That's one of the things that we desire. That's one of the efforts that flows out of our lives. Yes, it's burdensome, but we're okay to live with burdens. They're worth it. They're worth it. So there's some big, there's some big ideas that I want you to be reminded of in this. You have to be very careful in, 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 in this type of, duty of bringing people back because walls are up, right? And often it might turn into an argument where voices may be raised, or they may feel judged, 
right? It's not easy to do this, and let's be fair about that. In Galatians chapter six, it says that we are to do this with gentleness. It uses that word, gentleness. If your Christianity doesn't have gentleness in it yet, then you need to regroup. We should be described as gentle. Gentle with the way that we approach that situation. Gentle with the way that we hear what you're going through. Gentle with the way that we get involved in people's lives. Gentle with the way that we address ugly, bad things. Gentleness. If you want to bring somebody back, it will take gentleness. Understanding. Remember all the ways that wandering represented itself? Wandering from truth and not understanding and led astray? So they're wandering from the truth for whatever reason, and so gentleness is gonna come back and understand that. So gentleness. Another one, Ephesians 4 tells us that anything we ever say must be speaking the truth in love. And I know everybody knows that expression from Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love. This can't be, you've hurt my feelings. This can't be, hey, you're embarrassing the family. This can't be, hey, what's everybody gonna think? This has got to be in love. This has got to be truth is on my mind, truth is on my, on my heart, love is on my mind, love is in my heart, and here is why I'm having this conversation with you, speaking the truth in love. And one other thing that I want to say in regards to the duty to bring them back is what we see in the passage on church discipline in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 is where Jesus shows us church discipline, and I want you to hear something. In verse 15, he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Did everybody hear that? You have gained your brother. The Bible has this category of going after hard situations and seeing good, positive, beneficial, fruitful response from it. It is our duty to bring them back. Now, the cool thing about God is that he loves to do this work, and God does this. And if you haven't thought about it much, then maybe all you've thought about is it doesn't really happen. But if you'll start thinking about it, and you'll start looking around, and you'll start kind of getting more into people's lives, you'll see this happens quite a bit. There are lots of you here today that were gone for a while. There are lots of you here today that were running away from God. I know pastors that had whole chunks of season in their life back in the day where they were running from God. I know people who would say, man, I was wandering from the truth and it messed me up, but they've been brought back. It happens all the time. And this week, I reached out to just one of the many people in our church that had a big season like this. And I said, man, tell me how you would re re recall that whole thing that happened, that whole season of you wandering away from the truth. And he came back to it and he said, man, I feel like God saved me all over again. I feel free. I feel like I got life and I, I see the salvation of Christ working inside of me. I feel redeemed. I said, praise the Lord. I said, well, what do you think were the factors that helped to that? And he said, there were brothers in my life in the church that did not give up on me and did not let me go so far that I could not come back. And them staying in my life kept me knowing I could come back. He said that very thing. Did we cry? Was it ugly? Did it hurt? Were we mad? Were we scared? Was all of that going on? Yes. Are they back? Yes. God does that. And you and I need to hear that it is the duty to be about that, okay? But make sure that this word truth is not lost in all of that. They wandered away from the truth, and the goal is to bring them back to the truth. Everybody got that? Okay, if they, if they used to be UK and now they're U of L and you're thinking what an embarrassment that is and we gotta get them back, that's not what we're talking about or anything else as foolish as that, okay? If they left our church and we're just trying to get them back here, that ain't it either. If they're still with the truth, we rejoice, amen? It's about truth. That's only what it's about, truth. So there's a duty to bring them back. And then lastly, there is a delight 
in being a part of it. And James seems to get this. Look at verse 20. Let him know, man, remind that guy, remind that guy that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Hey, man, it's already been paid for. Hey, it's all good. See, one of the awesome things about wandering away from truth is that the journey away might be days and weeks and months and years and miles and states and countries. I mean, you might be way far away, but you know how, far, you know how as far away as it is a way. You know how close it is to get back? One step of repentance. Isn't that awesome? You might say, man, I have been wandering from God for so long. I've been into sin. I've been so distracted. I ain't listened to truth in so long. And you know how easy it is to get back? You put your knees on the ground and you say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry. God, forgive me of my sins. Have mercy upon me. Help me, God. And guess what? You're back. Now, the circumstances may not have changed, but guess who you got back? God, you are that back. And seriously, here's what happens. People wander away from the truth, and they wander away from the truth, and they wander away from the truth, and they start thinking, man, I ain't talked to those people in so long. They're all mad at me. They probably think I'm a failure. I mean, I've made so much damage. I mean, I gotta get myself back together before I can. I mean, people say all of those things, and we hear them all the time, and I'm telling you, it is one about face turn, 180 degrees, to get back focused on the Lord Jesus, and you're back. The goal was not back in the full mix. The goal was not back working in the nursery. The goal was back to truth. And as soon as you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that God loves you no matter what, how sinful you are, and you're free, you're back. And that's all we wanted. Our goal is for you to worship God. Our goal is for you to make it to heaven. Our goal is for your heart to be free and forgiven of sins. You can come back to tr come back to truth, and we love seeing it. We love, we love, we love seeing it. There's such a delight in being a part of it, and James seems to get this. For as hard as James has been in five chapters of railing on people who aren't living what they say they believe, James ends it with, hey, let them know that they can be right back. Hey, and let them know that if you help somebody come right back, that was awesome. That is church. That's Christianity. That's brothers and sisters of Christ having each other's back, holding each other accountable, loving each other to salvation. That's what that is. Let them know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now notice that it ends with these big subjects we've already mentioned of a dead soul. Spiritual death. Not knowing God. Not believing that God loves you. Man, that's a bad place to be. And for as deep and bad as that is, and very real, think about how joyful it is to see people turn back. Think about that. The other one is a multitude of sins. And I think we all understand very well what sin does to us. You know what it's like to have a guilty conscience? You know what it's like to feel like, man, I feel dirty. I feel wrong. I feel like, man, I don't want anybody to know what's going on here. I can't do that. I know I'm supposed to be the one who's praying, but I can't even pray. I feel so ashamed. I know I'm supposed to be the one helping people get, get close to God, but I can't. And sin does that, right? And we can all admit that there are times in our lives where we can't really get ourselves going. The Bible says, we can help people save their soul and cover their sins. Now, Jesus is the Savior. We're not getting confused here. We don't become the Savior. But God uses people to help people turn back. Isn't that beautiful? Last night, as I was watching the Ravens get beat down, I got a text from Miss Jetty, one of our senior ladies, 
Late at night on a Saturday, I'm thinking, oh, Miss Jetty, don't, don't distract me too much, Miss Jetty. And here's what she said. I just got off the phone with a guy in our church that's in his 20s who hasn't been to church in over a year. And he says he's thinking about coming back. Doesn't that make you happy? Yes, it does. The delight in being a part of it. I've been reading to the kids Pilgrim's Progress at night. And there's so many good illustrations in that book. But in one of the parts, Christian comes to a fork in the road. And he wrestles with which way he should go. He wrestles with which way he should go. Is this the way that leads to eternal life in heaven or is it this the way he doesn't know? And he recalls some truth and thinks, with the truth I know, it's that direction. But then he listens to some worldly advice and he thinks, nah, I think it's this way. And he goes that way. And it is the realest picture of wandering from the truth. And within no time, he realizes this was not right. I didn't listen to the truth. I'm caught up now in all these weeds and all these briars and I'm so distracted and I'm not on the right way. I've wandered away. And do you know what happens at that part of the story? Just out of nowhere, his good friend evangelist pops back up and says, why are you over here? Why are you over here? Don't you know to stay on the straight and narrow that's led by the truth? And Christian says, yes, I know that, but I got to thinking and I thought I should go that way. He says, guess what? Get back on the truth and keep going. And it's happy to read that. I know a man who's in the ministry. And I remember asking him, man, tell me your story. When did you get called in the ministry and God start doing all that? He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I came to know the Lord when I was a kid, teenager, when I was a young kid. And you know, I was growing and all of that, but I'm gonna be totally honest. About the time that I started growing up and becoming a real teenager, 16, 17, 18, about the time I went off to college, I had completely lost my way. I mean, I didn't go to church. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't care anything about it. I said, well, what happened? Because now you're, you're a pastor in a church. What, what happened? He said, I'm gonna tell you what happened. And he named the lady. He said, I'm gonna tell you such and such, miss such and such. She said, grandma in the church. He said, I was at college. And she called me on the phone. And she said, you were home on Christmas break. You were home over the last weekend, I heard. I saw you at the football game. I heard that you've been home. He said, yes, ma'am, I was. She said, well, why weren't you in church sitting beside me? She said, the next time you're home, pardon my French, your butt better be beside me in church. He said, the next time he came home, he went, he, went, he sat beside her, and the word of God did the rest. He had been brought back. And to this day, he's brought back. Does that make you happy that that lady called him? Does that make you happy that she said that? Yes, it does. There is a danger of wandering away from the truth. We have a duty to bring them back. And it is a delight to be a part of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, of the way James ends it. God, he didn't leave us saying, well, that's a good one. He leaves us saying, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Father, we pray that you would indeed use us. Help us to be a church family that is not critical, that is not above, that is not better than, that is not judgmental, but is lovingly concerned. Help us in this work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to challenge you to get involved in that work right away. Start reaching out to people that you know have wandered. And if you're here today and you're ready to get focused on Christ, you would admit that you can't help anybody get focused on Christ because you're not focused on Christ. Then I'm glad you're here today. And I would love to talk with you now. As we sing, let's respond.
Christ commands all the hosts of heaven. Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and Consumes like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. could rescue me from my failing who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only a holy god only close this morning with the passage that uh, for some reason the Lord seems to always kind of bring to my mind whenever we're 
talking about our responsibilities to one another from Hebrews chapter 3. It says, take care, brothers, or be careful, brothers, or watch out, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort or encourage or remind one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Amen.